Well, hey, good evening, Paradigm. If you have a copy of God's Word, and I hope you do, won't you find the book of Philippians chapter 4 as we are concluding our series that we just have called Philippians after the letter that we find in the New Testament. If you're new to the Bible, Philippians is going to be uh, towards the, the end of your Bible. You'll find like Galatians, Ephesians, and then Philippians right before Colossians, and it's just tucked away right there. Real short letter. If you wanted to read a book of the Bible this week, we encourage you to read Philippians. You can read it like an Less than an hour. It's my kind of reading, right? It's just short to the point, and it's going to punch you right in the teeth. But we are concluding tonight this series in Philippians, and it's been an amazing journey. And if you haven't been journeying with us and you're just kind of dropping in and visiting us tonight, we have been walk, walking verse by verse through this letter to this church that's the first European church uh, ever to be uh, founded in this little town called Philippi. And as you're getting there to Philippians 4, I just want to let you know a little bit about the way um, I grew up as a young adult. I was um, really in high school was when we fell on financially tough times. And so I got the news when I was in middle school that my dad was going to be leaving our family. Some of y'all been through that before. Really, really difficult time. And, and the way that played out in our family's life is that my mom really didn't have a lot of stability financially. And so she um, did what she could do real quick to get a real estate license. And she was going to launch into the real estate industry. And as some of you know that have done something similar, uh, to this, it's not easy just to just to go like be successful in real estate in your first year or your first five years or 10 years for some of us anyway. And so she jumps out into this deal and we just fell on tough financial times. And so I'm in high school and I'm getting ready to go to college and we don't have a lot of money. And some of y'all been right there before, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, I was being recruited by this private school, which are never cheap, right? I'm being recruited by this private school to play college football, and, uh, and I'm really excited about it. But I'm asking the question that a lot of you have asked when you went to college, how am I going to pay for this, right? You ever ask that question? How am I going to pay for this education? Well, I just kind of sign up and say, you know what, we'll figure it out. And I planned on some finances to get me to the college for about one semester. And I thought, man, if I get one semester of playing college football and getting to study here at this private university, man, hot dogs, it'd be great. Anyway, I find out, long story short, I find out that there's this lady who hears my story and she is a, a donor to this college. Well, she hears my story and then she writes me a letter and says, hey, I want to pay for your, I want to pay for your college in totality. And like, not just my tuition, I'm talking about everything. She said, how much money do you need to cover all your expenses for your entire time while you attend this university? Isn't that awesome? And so I'm like, praise Jesus, thank you God, right? And so I was able to go to this campus and get into some classes. I was able to study biology, which just allows you to see the marvels of this world. And, and then I took a, I had a minor in religious studies, so I'm studying biology, marvels of this world, theology, the marvels of God. And, and I got to play football. I'm, I'm on this field getting to go all over the South and play a game that's America's greatest game. Come on, all right. And I mean, it's just amazing, right? I'm getting to live in this amazing adventure of learning some things. And, and doing some things. I met my best friends in college. I, I crossed paths with the woman that I, that, I, that I loved, that I'm married to. I proposed to her at my college. I mean, so many great memories and so many amazing things that took place in this season of life because someone decided to be generous. And I was able to learn some things and I was able to do some things because this lady gave some things. And because of this woman's generosity, I was able to have the experience of a lifetime. And I share that with you tonight because we come to this place called Paradigm. And, and what we do regularly is that we invite young adults into the mission and the movement of Jesus Christ. And we believe that this is the greatest thing that you can give your life to that we have joined in our little slice of history, this continuum of the greatest movement that has swept the planet called the church. That Jesus Christ, the most amazing human being, the MVP of Christianity, he steps onto the scene like 2,000 years ago. God made flesh. And he dies on this cross, raises from the grave, ascends to the right hand of the Father, and he starts this thing called the church that has done more good for this world and has prepared more people for the next than any other thing. And we invite people into this mission and this movement. And listen, Jesus wants to radically change your life. He, he wants to move in and internally begin to work in your life and change you from the inside out. And we come to this gathering and we learn some things from God's word so that we can go do some things for the sake of God. And because of someone's generosity, every one of you sit here tonight, me included. 
Like you're able to learn some things and you're able to be propelled to go do some things because people have given some things. Like the seat that you're sitting in was paid for by someone other than you. And because of someone's generosity, you're getting to hear the gospel. Like generosity, it always precedes the gospel. And my concern here tonight is that some of us We'll, we'll come in here and, and people have paid the price and so that you can hear the gospel, so that you can hear the word of God, so you can know some things, so that you can learn some things and that you'll squander it all. Like, like that God, he's given you some things, that, that he's entrusted with you some resources. He's given you talents and abilities. And my fear is that you would cash it in for something else. Like so when this lady uh, was paying for my school, um, the way it worked out was a little bit odd uh, looking back on it, I just didn't know any different. I didn't roll with people like this. And so, like, I would meet with her once a year in the summertime, and, and I would kind of give her an update on how school went, how my grades were, what happened on the football field, that sort of thing. And, and then she would ask me this, this question, a business question, kind of an awkward question, but it was, hey, how much money do you need next year? And I would rattle off the several thousands of dollars I needed to be able to pay for everything at this school, and she would cut me a check personally. And so the way I grew up was that you paid with things with cash. And so I would literally take that check, I would go to the bank, I would cash it. I'd roll up into the registrar's office in August, like I'm a part of the cartel, like slinging cocaine or something all summer, and I would just drop bennies on the table, like how much is it? Okay, yeah, and I would just drop them down, you know? Now I want you to imagine, like she cut me this check, I wouldn't cast this check. And I'm like, you know what, I could pay for college or I could pay for a new car. And I decided to go out and just pay cash for a brand new ride and I've never been able to do that. Now here's what would have happened. She would have entrusted me with the funds that I needed to go know some things and needed to go do some things that would radically have impacted my life. And I would have taken those things that she had entrusted with me and went and squandered them on a new car. And I would be sitting here 11 years later driving an 11-year-old truck talking about what I could have done and what I could have learned. And I think that's a picture of some of us here tonight. Like, like what if God has entrusted you all that he's given you so that you would leverage it to know him and to make him known and you're taking all that he's given you, all your abilities, all of your resources, and you're using them on things that don't matter to him. Like, I don't want you to snooze through your 20s chasing the Kansas City dream, binging on Boulevard and barbecue competitions, and, and squander the opportunity to know God in this season and to make him known. So if you're taking notes tonight, I've titled this message, Give and Go. It's basketball season. Give and go, all right? And I want you to see this tonight. I want you to see that giving is a good thing, that, that you can invest in forever and that God's gonna hook you up with everything that you need. Uh, Paul, he's, uh, he's writing to this church that was like one of the most generous churches back in the day, this church at Philippi, and they had crossed paths with this guy named Paul, and Paul had shared the gospel with them, shared how they could have a relationship with Jesus, and, and he shares with this eclectic group of people that all are from the same hometown, and so they show up for, um, you know, like, church, you know, they didn't really know what they were doing. They're like, hey, we should meet up. And so they meet up and, and there's this, this people from all over the map and they come together and they form the church at Philippi. And, and they begin to live on mission and they keep up with Paul. And they're like, Paul, where are you headed next? And then they begin to support and fund all of Paul's missionary journeys. And, and Paul's writing this letter to them. And he's saying, man, thank you so much for your generosity. And, and like, they're like, man, we, we, are, we were glad to support you. And, and we are reading this letter tonight because of the generosity of people in a town called Philippi that was destroyed by an earthquake in the seventh century. Think about that for a second. The Bible you have tonight is yours because of someone else's generosity. And so we read Philippians chapter four, starting in verse 14, it says, yet it was, a, it was good of you to share in my troubles. You could have circled that, that whole verse. It was good of you to share in my troubles. It says, moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. 
Or even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Put on one if you're taking notes tonight, write this down. Giving is good. Giving is good. So, so Paul, he, he's sponsored by this church, and they've journeyed with him like through the ups and downs of his ministry. And so they've been sending him things as he's needed things. And, and what's ironic is that he's like, instead of saying, hey, thank y'all so much for what you sent me, he said, hey, the thing that you did, the generosity that you showed me, that, it, was a, it was a good thing for you. <laughs> like someone ever gave you a gift, and you're like, hey, I'm really glad that you were able to give me a gift. You know, it's kind of weird, right? And Paul's telling them, it was a good thing that you shared in my troubles. And the reason why he's telling them this is because he knows something that we need to know tonight, that we are hardwired for generosity. Like when we live a life of generosity and we give to the mission and the movement of Jesus Christ, this is a good thing for you. Not only does it advance the mission and the movement of Jesus, but it advances some things in you. Like when we help meet the need of others, it helps meet a need inside of us. And like in order for you to get what only God can give you, you have to give what only God has given you. And God wants to give you some amazing things that you can't go out and buy. The book of Proverbs, it says this very wisely. It says a generous person will prosper and whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Proverbs eleven twenty five. a generous person will prosper. It's a promise in God's word. And some of you are like, you know what, Chad, but that's just an old book and it was written a long time ago and, you know, it's going to say things like that so that it will fund itself, that sort of thing. But, but I, I, would, I would challenge you with this. I was doing um, some research this week and I came across a book called the, Ge- the Paradox of Generosity written by Christian Smith, who's a sociologist at Notre Dame, and he wanted to study the science behind generosity. And here's one of the things that he noted, that generosity is paradoxical. He said it kind of doesn't make sense. Those who give receive back in turn. By spending ourselves for others' well-being, we enhance our own standing. In letting go of some of, we, of what we own, we ourselves move toward flourishing. This is not only a philosophical or religious teaching, it's a sociological fact. Did you catch that? That the social sciences are proving what the Bible commanded us to do. In failing to care for others, we do not properly take care of ourselves. I love it when the sciences catch up with the Word of God. Like what the scripture is saying is that the more you give, the more you get. Not some financial investment thing, right? I'm not telling you like if you'll donate $100 on this stage before you leave tonight, God will give you 200 back. That ain't what we're talking about. Don't get crazy on me, all right? But what their research has shown is that when you give, you get happiness. The people who live generous lives lead more healthy lives. The people, according to this study, the ones that live generously, they live with a greater sense of purpose. If you want happiness, if you want health, if you want purpose, give. Giving is good. And according to their analysis of measurable data, people who are generous with their money, time, and associations are happier, healthier, and more resilient than less generous counterparts. Giving is good. If you're taking notes, you can just write this down. It's a real simple statement. The more you give, the better you live. The, the more you give, the better you live. Like, like this research, um, when they were doing it, they, they had to kind of quantify what it means to be a generous person. And so what they said is that you've got to give more than just kind of spontaneously. Or spontaneously. You, you gotta give regular, regularly. That what they said is that the people who gave generously were those who didn't just kind of like, you know, drop a few uh, dollars in the guy that's panhandling's cup, or they weren't just people that just kind of gave, you know, once a year. These were people that gave regularly. That's what he quantifies as a generous person. I, I wonder, are you a generous person? Like if people were using adjectives to describe you, would gener- generous be one of those adjectives? Like do you give regularly? Um, most people don't. The, the statistics of, of Americans, we were one of the most, we were like one of the most wealthy um, uh, nations in the, in the world, right? But we're one of the stingiest as well. So what's crazy to me is like anxiety is up in our, in our society, right? Um, um, unhappiness is up, but so is materialism. And maybe it's because generosity's down. Are you a generous person? And Paul, he's, he's like giving these, these people in Philippi a shout out because they followed him through the ups and downs and they, they gave to him consistently. 
And he says this, he says, it was a good thing for you to share in my troubles. Whose troubles are you sharing? Like, like who are you caring for? What cause that is worthy are you giving to regularly? Some of you are like, man, I don't even, I don't even know what to give to. Like, Chad, what do you, what do you give to? Well, I give to the things that trouble God and the things that trouble man. So the things that trouble God would be like people who don't know him. 2 Peter 3, 9 says that God doesn't wish that any would perish, but that everyone would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And I give to the things that advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you claim to know him, you should give to those things too. Like I want you to imagine, like um, for some reason I, was, I found out I had an estranged daughter, all right? Let's just say that one of my kids got estranged from me, okay? And, and, and I don't know why, but for some reason I wasn't able to go get her, but I was able to give you all the money you needed to connect her to me, all right? So imagine that with me real quick. And, and, then, and then I said, hey, could you get her to me by said date? I'll give you all the money that you need, and then you show up at that date without my daughter, all right? So, something went wrong. And then you roll up in there like dapping me up, like what's up, Chad? And, and, and uh, you start like bragging like, Chad, look at my new watch. Like it, it's got like a touch screen and stuff. It measures my heartbeat, Chad. It measures my steps and then everything else. And, and, then, and then you got pulled out your phone, you're like, Chad, let me show you this new car that I got with the money you gave me. Man, it's a fast car, it like connects with my watch and when I, when I turn my watch this way, I ain't gotta turn the wheel, it's just all connected. I'm like, and then you're like, oh man, look at this house. I, Chad, that money you gave me got me this watch, got me this ride, got me this house and I said, where's my daughter? And I think it troubles God that we're not troubled by the things that troubles him. And if you need to know what to give to, give to the mission of God. Whose trouble are you carrying? We give to the things that trouble God and the things that trouble man. Like you know, James, one of, uh, it's Jesus' half-brother, one of the guys that helped start a church in Jerusalem. He says this in James 127, he says, true religion that God does not despise is that you look after the widows and the orphan in their affliction or in their trouble. Uh, this word widow and, and orphan, this phrase, it's just kind of a phrase for people who can't look after themselves. These are people who are helpless in our society. Well, what people have you partnered with to help carry their trouble? Me and my family, we pray regularly for two little muchachitas, Anna Lee and Leslie. The Peruvian little girls, the same age as my girls, and we pray for them regularly. And Annalie and Leslie, they cannot have proper hygiene. They cannot have the things that they need in order to be able to just make it through life unless me and my family give uh, close to $100 a month. It's a drop in the bucket to give them a life that they so desperately need. And one day I'll get to meet these little girls and I'll be able to hug them and be able to hear about how God is working in their life. God wants to use you to do that in a similar way. He wants you to care for the troubles, uh, the, the, the troubles of God and the troubles of man. And I think sometimes God is troubled over our lack of concern for people in trouble. And giving, it's, it's good. Wh whose trouble are you carrying? Wh whose trouble are you sharing? I, I wonder, are you a generous person? Maybe, maybe I should just back up. Are you a Christian because I, I don't know that you can be a Christian and not be generous, or you got a gospel problem. See, see, what the gospel says is that God, he's a generous God. Like, he, he literally gave everything. Like, like, generosity precedes the gospel, literally. And so God, he, he sees us in our need. He doesn't wait for us to pay something. The only thing that we contributed to our debt, or to our the only thing that we contributed to our salvation was the debt that made it necessary. And so God, he sees us in our debt and he gives generously all of himself. His son Jesus, he comes and lives a sinless life. He dies on the cross, giving it all, bleeding out so that we could be forgiven. And the gospel tells us that he rose from the grave and he, he is victorious and seated on the throne and the gospel says that this generous God, he came to you so that you would know him and that giving is good and that God, he carried our trouble. Are you a generous person? 
Paul, he goes on in verse 17, he says this, uh, not that I desire your gifts, it's, it's kind of funny because Paul's like, hey, thank you so much for the gift, y'all did a good job, and they, man, it's amazing, but, but I'm, I, I don't wanna get it twisted here. I, I'm not desiring you to like go fund me and start some sort of preachers and sneakers campaign for me so that I can get some new shoes or whatever, that sort of thing, all right? He's saying like, I didn't, I didn't need it, but I'm appreciative for it, and he says, what I desire is that more be credited to your account. I love this language. Point number two, if you're taking notes, write this down, investing in forever. <laughs> investing in forever. Paul's like, man, what y'all did was really for y'all's best interest because God doesn't waste an invested dollar in his kingdom. And Paul, he's informing them about the economy of God here. And, and he's saying, this is how God views our generosity. He, he views our generosity as an investment in eternity. Like, like there are stocks available eternal stocks available that you could purchase today that will pay dividends forever. I don't know about you, but man, I, uh, I, like when I give my money away, like I just feel like, man, it's just gone, you know? I'm like, I just, I just really would like to know how people are gonna spend my money when I just kind of give it to them. And I have a hard time letting go of money at times because I told you I grew up without much money and so I kind of have this scarcity mentality, like, man, I ain't trying to go back to Ramen and Shasta. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if y'all remember those days, right? And you throw some cheese on the ramen thinking that it's faux hot la la or something like, you know what I'm saying? You're just trying to dress it up, right? But it just ain't the same, you know? And I ain't trying to go back to those days. And so there's this tendency that has me reluctant to give. And then I'm really concerned about when I give that, like, what you going to be doing with my money? And what God tells us in his word is that when we give, it is credited to our account. Listen, we don't have to buy our salvation, praise God. Jesus did that, okay? But we have been entrusted with the resources that we have been given, and we will stand before Jesus someday, and we will give an account for how we leverage those things for what matters to him. Let me explain it this way. I don't know if y'all have ever had a, like somebody panhandle you, you know, might like beg for some money, you know, and... And, and like, I'm always just kind of leery of that when somebody comes up and they're like, hey man, can I, can I have some money? And, and I'm like, what are you gonna do with my money exactly? You know, and, and I'm, I'm always just trying to kind of discern in those moments. And I'm not gonna tell you whether you should give money or shouldn't give money to people paying in. That's, that's really between you and God. Use discretion, okay? Don't follow him into a back alley, ladies, all right? That's just not good, all right? Trying to save him, okay, that's not gonna work, okay? And, and so anyway, I just, you know, I always use discretion in those moments. But, but here's deep down, here's my concern, right? My concern is that I'm going to give him money, which I worked hard for, and that he is going to take that money, and, and he's going to go spend that on something I don't approve of. I wonder if God views us that way. Like, I wonder if God's concerned about you, and whether or not he should entrust you with more of his money, because he doesn't know if you're going to go spend that on something that he doesn't approve of. And we say, God, I want you to bless me. Well, you need to bless God. And you need to give him confidence that you're gonna leverage the resources and the talents he's given you to spend it on what matters to God. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 6, he says, hey, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin or rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin don't destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And what Jesus is saying is like, hey, don't spend your wealth that I gave you on things that don't matter. But you can start investing in eternity now. Like, like I, I know it's uncomfortable. We're talking about money. And, and we're not going to be taking up an offering tonight. Just take a deep breath. We're not here to make money. We're here to preach the Bible and make disciples. And so we're going to talk about the things that we need to talk about so that you can become the man or the woman that he's created you to become. And Jesus wants you to leverage all that you have to invest in what he's called you to invest in. Like, like what if you could buy today something that would pay dividends forever? But I think we're kind of stuck in this, this like, man, should I invest in the, the kingdom or should I invest in, in the world? And, and there's, these, there's these lucrative opportunities that we are entertained with and tempted by. Like a few uh, months ago, we had this lady who used to work for a company called Enron. You may not know who Enron is, but they're, they're um, a company based out of Houston back in the day. 
and they were like the most lucrative in the oil and gas industry. Like they were balling, y'all. They were like a $60 billion company. They were public. You could buy stocks with them. People were just, they were buying stocks with Enron, Enron this, Enron this. They were just so fired up. People getting paid by Enron. Stock market was just all Enron, Enron, Enron. It was all a lie. And so I'm in high school and it comes out that they had, been, they had been lying about how much money they had made and they were bankrupt and everyone that had invested in Enron was bamboozled. And I share that with you because I think that's a picture of what Satan wants for us all. Like he wants you to invest in this world. You invest in this world, it's gonna pay you back. It's gonna pay dividends. You about, I mean, it's gonna, you're about to be balling. You're about to get all of this stuff. It's gonna hook you, hook you up all, all just to deceive you so that you'll come to the end of your life and you'll realize it's just a crooked scam. But God wants you to invest in what will matter forever. Like think about it, what if there was something that, that you, you could invest in like, like the, that you knew it was gonna pay dividends. Like, like maybe you was like, a, like an 85 model like me. You know, you born in the 80s. And, and your mom was like, you know, I heard about this thing called Apple. It sounded healthy, so I bought you some stock in it, you know? <laughs> like I wish mom would have done that, right? Like don't you wish you would have hopped on the Netflix train when you were still shopping at Blockbuster? Some of y'all don't remember them days, right? <laughs> remember those days, you check out movies. Oh, it ain't there, you know, anyway. Some of y'all hoping Bitcoin's gonna be the next thing, right? Good luck, okay. We're gonna make money to sell this money anyway. So, don't you wish you could have invested in the Apostle Paul? Who are you investing in that's gonna advance the gospel in a way that maybe you, you have no idea that you're gonna hear about in eternity? That you can invest in forever tonight and so the way this plays out, like how you start doing this, let me just kind of break it down for you in a couple of categories. First of all, give to your local church. Like if, if you have a local church, if, if it's not Abundant Life, praise God, give to that church. If it's Abundant Life, give to Abundant Life. Listen, if you're not giving to your local church, you're sinning. It's clearly laid out. And when you give to your local church, you are advancing the mission that Jesus came to start, all right? And so at Abundant Life, this is what I can speak of. I know some of the things that we do. Abundant Life gave $1.1 million to missions this year. This year. Yeah, you clap, that's good. Some of y'all can't even fathom, right? 1.1, we, we gave away a million pounds of groceries this year from our food pantry back here. We're giving away turkey dinners to, I think, over 300 or 500 people in our local area tomorrow. And what you're doing is that you are, you are funding an organization here called Abundant Life, if you give to Abundant Life, that, that is funding people on the front line of ministry. And what we want you to do is that we want you to fund the front line of ministry, and then we want you to go be the front line of ministry. And that $1.1 million, man, every dollar represents a destiny. And there's this guy I met when I first moved up here to KC, a guy named Brady Reed. Brady grew up in our church and went off to college. And, and he, um, he, he got, man, he was like, man, I'm about to go start something new in the Philippines. And so he, he started fundraising. We give money to Brady, and Brady is in the Philippines. And he is reaching literally hundreds of college students in Manila area. And he has started ministries that did not exist until him and his team got there. And they're recruiting teams and there's this movement of God that is taking place in the Philippines that we have had the opportunity to fund him. And then we've also had the opportunity to raise up one of our young adults to go and fund the, or go and be the front line of ministry. And so tonight, like if you wanna do something that would bless the heart of God, there's this, um, there's this document that you can pick up at the Next Steps desk. And listen, you can go global this year. Some of y'all need to go to your mom and daddy who got way, way more money that they're gonna hook you up for Christmas and say, hey, I don't want anything for Christmas. I wanna go to Africa. And you need to take the money. You're like, a lot of you are gonna get disposable income, hundreds of it, this, this, like in, in 60 days. Let that be the down payment for you to go to Peru. And go be the front line of ministry while you're young and while you have the agility and the liberty to go do that. Others of you, you can't go give like when it comes to missions, there are, there are zealous givers, there are zealous, zealous goers, and the disobedient. That we've got to give and go paradigm. 
In this church, it is a sending church. And we need more people to tithe to support the mission, but we need our church to tithe people to accomplish the mission. And so give and go. Some of you are like, well, do I have to be a missionary? Like, is that a calling? You know, I haven't heard the voice of God. You don't need a voice. You got a verse. It says to go into all the nations and make disciples. Don't wait till you get theological training. Wait till you get Jesus. He'll send you the spirit. You got what you need. Not that theological training is bad. We need that too. But you don't need the voice of God. You have a verse, and verses are better than voices. You know, I was talking with, with Bill Gibbs. He's our outreach pastor here at Abundant Life. And, and I said, hey, Bill, if you had the chance to speak to a few hundred young adults tonight about outreach, I mean, like, it's his job to mobilize people to go all across the, the globe. Like, the, the sun never sets on the ministry of Abundant Life. It's amazing. And he, he said, man, I would tell those young adults, you, you learn a trade you, you learn a vocation and then you leverage your vocation for the mission of God. Because once you have a skill, you can use that wherever you go in the world. And so some of you, it's gonna lead you to go clear across the world to the, to the Philippines, but others of you, it's gonna lead you just to, to plant right here and to leverage your gifts for the ministry that's taking place right here. Um, earlier today, I got to go to this coffee shop called Rehope. It's down in the wood, Greenwood. <laughs> anyway, Rehope, and, and Rehope, it exists to help raise money for this organization that's called the Restoration House, and the Restoration House helps rehab people that are getting out of sex trafficking. What a noble cause. And so the, the president of Restoration House, they're like, man, we've got this space. We should launch a, a coffee shop. Who could start this? And he identified somebody that resonated with the, the purpose of Restoration House, a couple of our young adults that are actually here tonight. And, and he came to these women, and these women have like an entrepreneurial spirit. And he said, hey, I see that you're starting floral businesses and jewelry businesses. What if you used those gifts and those abilities to help start a business to help raise money for the Restoration House? And so they're leveraging their gifts and their abilities to be on mission in a coffee shop. These two little girls, these two little women, put some of us men to shame with their boldness and courage. You could do that too. Invest in forever. How are you investing in eternity? Paul, he goes on in verse 18, he says, I have received full payment and I have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gift that you sent. He says, they are a fragrant offering an acceptable sacrifice to God. What Paul's saying, he's like, man, hey, I got the gift. I just wanna let y'all know. And I'm like, wow, like this is gonna help me out to be able to do what God's called me to do. And, and, he, and he reminds me, he says, your sacrifice, it makes God happy too. And so he leverages this Levitical language. There's this old book in, in the Old Testament called Leviticus and there were these five offerings and two offerings were required in order for you to make sacrifice to receive forgiveness of sins. And then three offerings that were offered just to say, God, I love you. And, and one of the offerings that was offered just to say, God, I love you, was a fragrant offering. And so Paul's saying, like, the gift that you gave, when you are generous towards God, it's a way of you saying, God, I love you. And your generosity is closely connected to your worship of God. And so Paul, he, he's giving them a shout out for this. And, and he goes on in verse 19, he says, and my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Point number three, and finally, if you're taking notes tonight, write this down, God will meet your needs. God will meet your needs. Somebody need to hear that tonight. Somebody's coming here tonight and you have forgotten that God is a good God. And God, he's called Jehovah Jireh. That means God, my provider. And God will meet your needs. He's gonna take care of you, I promise. I've been through want and I've been through plenty. And God has been the same consistent provider through it all. And it may seem bleak in your circumstance or your situation, but this is just a greater opportunity for God to show out. And I can't explain how God provides, but I can't deny that he provides. And God is a good God. And the scriptures just told us that he will meet all of your needs according to the glorious riches of Christ Jesus. But I think sometimes we get our needs and our wants twisted, don't we? You know? Like we think, I, I need that thing but really, you don't, you don't need that thing. You just want that thing. I've got a neighbor. His name is JJ. 
And JJ, he's like, a, he's like an old gangster, like for real gangster, all right? He's an OG, OG, all right? JJ grew up in the hood of Kansas City. He's got, he's got gun wounds on him, knife marks on his face. And I'll be talking to him, and then he's like, man, people don't know how I grew up. I grew up fighting. You know, I grew up fighting for everything I got. And I'll, and I'll talk with J.J. about Christ. And, and J.J., like, he's just an interesting cat. He, he's, he's in his 70s. He's the front man of a funk band called Platinum Express. And they go around the casinos in the city, and they entertain folks. J.J.'s cool, y'all. And, I, and I'll, I'll say, yeah, this is what I do. I get, to, I get to share with young adults. He's like, you need to tell those young adults. You need to tell them young people. Don't get your needs and your wants confused. That's what's wrong with the world. People got their needs and their wants confused. He said, don't get it twisted. If God got you upright, you got everything you need. That's what he said. And he's got this wisdom and this perspective, and he knows what we all need to know, that we don't need to get our needs and our wants twisted. And maybe the reason why you got so anxious or maybe the reason why you're doing such, so much work mentally is because you have this mental gymnastics routine going on trying to convince yourself that you need something that you actually just want. And the reason why you're getting anxious is because you don't have that thing. All the while, you're dismissing the glory of what God's provided for you today. Like it's Thanksgiving season, right? But, but isn't it ironic that in the season that we give thanks is the season that we shop the most? It's Thanksgiving. What's next? Because we get our needs and our wants twisted. See, we've come in here and most of us have a coveting problem. You ever heard that word, coveting? That means you want something you ain't got. And coveting, it made the top 10 on God's not-to-do list, all right? In the Ten Commandments, God said, thou shalt not covet. It means, hey, don't, don't go after stuff that you don't have no business trying to get, Right? This word covet in the Hebrew is the word pant. Or it means pant, like a dog, you know? You ever seen a dog that's, you know, dogs sweat through their mouth? We, we grew up in the South. They, my dog would get hot. His name was Hank. He would get hot. And he'd just start panting. <laughs> I mean, just, sl- just slobber everywhere, just sweating through his mouth. That's the picture of some of y'all over the new iPhone. <laughs> I got it, you know? Uh, in, in the Greek, the word covet means that you're white knuckling. Some of y'all got something in your life you're just hanging on to so tight. Like, I can't let it go. I can't, if I lose this, I'm. And God says, don't do that. You got your needs and your wants twisted. And my concern is that some of you will begin to ask God to give you something you want that you don't really need. And then when he withholds that thing that you want that you don't really need, you will walk away from God whom you desperately need. Blaming him because he didn't give you what you wanted. Jesus will meet all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. He's a good daddy, y'all. I've got three little girls, and man, I love meeting their needs making sure they got food in their belly, making sure they got a roof over their head, making sure they got the information they need to have a proper education, toothbrushes and toothpastes, brushes for their hair. And sometimes, you know, I'm a good dad. I'll throw in a doll every now and then, you know what I'm saying? Like, you don't need that, but, you know, I'm going to give you what you want. And that's how God works, too. If me being an evil father knows how to give good gifts, how much more will your Father in heaven give himself to those who ask. God will provide what you need. And when Paul, when he's thinking about this and about the church and all this generosity and all that God has done and what this means, like it, it just leads Paul just to emote with praise. And so in verse 20, here's what he says, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever, amen. Like, like this is what the, the theologians call a doxology. It just means like an exuberant praise. And, and, and what Paul is showing us is that, is that worship and generosity are always connected. That, that generosity should lead to doxology. And, and when, God, when God allows us and calls us to move and to give generously like the people of God, we should look at that and we should high five each other and then we should praise God for his goodness and his provision in our lives. And then Paul, he finishes this little letter to the church at Philippi, and he says, hey, greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me, they send greetings, and all God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. 
The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and be with your spirit, amen. So Paul, he finishes by saying, hey, like all of these people, and notice he says, the people in Caesar's household, we we are less than 100 years removed from the birth of Jesus, right? I mean, we are within that, that first century. And the gospel has swept uh, Jerusalem, it has swept the Middle East, and now it has already penetrated into Caesar's household, y'all. Like the gospel is the most unstoppable force that has ever swept the planet. And Paul, he writes this pen in, in this letter, he pins this letter, he just says, amen, and that means so let it be. He doesn't write the end because it's not the end. And you could imagine that this church would have gathered, much like we're gathering here tonight, and they would have heard this letter that Paul has written, like man, to live as Christ, to die as gain. That you got to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in everything consider Christ better than yourselves. Having the mind of Christ, who being in the very form of God did not count equality with God, something to be grasped. But he humbled himself and he took on the form of a servant. And he died. And then he rose from the grave. And at, at the name of Jesus, every knee's going to bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Beware of the dogs. Because they're going to come to kind of contort, contort some things and think that you got to add some things to the gospel and watch out for their teaching. That I considered all things rubbish compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ. I'm going to press on towards the goal, the prize. I'm going to have the win of Christianity. I'm not going to be anxious. Tell you already and the key to get along. And to think about these things, all the things that are praiseworthy, excellent. Think about these amazing things and be content. Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And Epaphroditus or Clement, whoever would have read that letter that day, they would have said, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, amen. And the church would have read this letter and they had a choice in time to respond. See, every time the word of God is read, it demands a response. Now think about the audience in the church that day at Philippi and who was there. Maybe it was a, a person that knew Paul. <laughs> and he's reading these words from an old friend. Maybe it was Lydia or, or this Philippian jailer. And they're like, man, Paul, he's, he's awesome, you know? And, they're like, and they remember, like, they gave money to Paul. They hooked him up. They helped him out. Maybe it was somebody that just joined the church. And, and, and they're like, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support this church at Philippi. Or maybe it was just somebody who was there raising their hands in worship but not involved in the mission. That everyone who heard this letter read in that day, they had a choice to make. And listen, so do you. We've invited you all throughout this series to consider your life. Like, what are you about? And if you wanna know what you are, you are about, look at your bank account. See, if God hasn't got a hold of your wallet, I doubt your walk. Because where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Are you given to the mission and the movement of Jesus Christ? Are you given financially, but also are you given you? What are you about to live as what for you? And in this room, there is a group of young adults who could radically change the, the face of Kansas City and the world, y'all that we have seats all around in this horseshoe that are yet to be filled, empty sections that you can go and implore people to come in and hear the gospel, but it's gonna take your generosity. That God is calling some of you tonight to just take your first step. That he's been beckoning you for some time, but you've been reluctant to follow him. Why? He loves you. He has a plan for you. Maybe you need to start tonight just by inviting Jesus and asking him to be your savior. Others of you, you've been tracking with the Lord for some time, but you're, in an, you're still in anonymity. You're in isolation. You need to get known. Get connected with somebody. And others of you, man, you're so agile. You got so much liberty. You got a skill set. And you're not using it to help advance the mission of God. Why not go global this year? What do you got to lose? What if paradigm was known 
for being one of the greatest sending ministries in Kansas City. Where we went and pushed back the gates of hell and we were compelled to do what this word says. Let's go church, let's go and let's give. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for tonight. God, we thank you that your word is so convicting. Now, when I measure my life and, and consider all that you've given me, you've been too good to me. Your grace is invaluable. How can I ever repay you? I can't, God, and I pray that you would just help me to, to be generous with what you've given me. God, I pray that you would eradicate the reluctant parts of my heart that are still stifled with greed. God, that you would remove a scarcity mentality and help me to have faith in you. God, I pray that you would help me to give strategically and often and regularly. God, I pray that you would help me to tithe my time. Help me to preach at places that, that have no honor like this place where I'm just a nobody. Help me to give away my gifts. God, help me to leverage my finances that you've entrusted in me, to be generous to my waitress and my waiter, and to give often to the mission of God. God, I pray for young adults tonight that don't know you. God, I pray they would come to know you. What a wild adventure it is to follow you. God, I pray that you would help us to be the men and be the women you've called us to be and help us to follow you with reckless abandon. Help Philippians not be a book that we read, but a book we live. And may we offer ourselves wholly to you. In Christ's name, amen.